Um, let, me, let me start this off by not doing a male thing, but a very Washington thing, <laughs> which is to take Carly's outrage and ask, how do we turn outrage into traction? Because that always is the Washington problem. And even in much more bloodless pieces of economics, one is very used to the idea that there are $50 notes or 50,000 yen notes on the sidewalk that countries simply won't pick up for a variety of reasons. And so turning to Heidi and to Manoush, I think we did have a commonality there in what Carly spoke about, about not having it be a women's issue was in more nice Washington speak and more functional Washington speak, what Heidi was talking about, about mainstreaming this, that this is part of the ongoing discussion of every policy. I commend that, but practical terms, Heidi, Mnuchin, in your day-to-day -day leadership roles in your organizations, what can you do to ramp up the outrage or utilize the outrage? And let me push it one step further. In the South African case, which especially those of us who did, I also went to college in the 80s, remember the anti-apartheid movement, there was a clear sanctioning mechanism as well as a boycott. Is that something which you can see functioning in this way? And where then do you draw the line? Do you draw it at Italy? Do you draw it at Pakistan? Do you draw it somewhere in between? So just a minor little Washington question for the two of you. Heidi? So I, I think that, that framing the, the, the idea that we all have a consistent framework of approaching this as literally not, not a, a women's issue, but that we need to, in the case of what I was talking about, this is an economic issue. This was meant to be a speech about growth. And, Which it was. And, and, women, was. And, women, and women do play a role in that. But in terms of, of how, you, how you mainstream and, and translate that into policy, we have various channels and institutions through which, through which we do that. Um, the, the mainstreaming uh, that I referred to took decades to, to achieve in, in many institutions from the UN um, to the World Bank and, and to the extent that we all challenge our own institutions to continue along those paths and also the ones, quite frankly, where you have um, the, the, the key into economic decision makers at the top of the totem pole that are very, very concerned about growth right now. Um, one of those institutions being, being the IMF. I, I go back to what Milan Verveer said, which is that the conversations with senior economic policymakers about growth that translate into GDP are the ones that get their attention. And to the extent that we can do that and use the institutions that we have to further in this sphere, I think that's really, that's really our challenge. Thank you. Manoush? Well, I mean, I think I, I you know, Necessity is the mother of invention, and at the moment, countries like Japan, which has not grown in decades, a country like Italy, which has not grown in a decade, uh, are having to look for new answers. And I think that enormous pressure, and the demographics are also, for the advanced economies, a huge issue. Yeah. I mean, you know, you cannot sustain these pension systems and social security systems unless you have more people contributing to them. They're just, it's just not tenable. So I think that uh, all of those pressures, the demographic and the growth challenges, will force policymakers who would never call themselves card-carrying feminists, uh, but just have to go there. Adam, may I use yeah. a very simple I, example? I, I, I was about to get to you, so please. Uh, um, <laughs> so when I say we need to reframe the question, which I think both Heidi and Manoush have done, so let me be clear, I agree with everything they've said and what they are trying to do in their respective institutions. Um, let's take a issue like food production, a growing concern in the world. We now know that women make extremely good farmers. We know in places around the world that if you give women the training and the tools to become farmers, that they're really very good at it. And in fact, there is a whole trend now around the feminization of agriculture that demonstrates that when you have more women as farmers, your food production goes up. So, one way of tackling this is not to say we're not here to talk about women, but 
when we are engaged with another government on the issue of food production, we're going to start asking very basic questions. How many women do you have who are farmers? Are you training them? Do they have the same access? I mean, there are just some basic questions that would get asked. If you start with the mindset in Washington and capitals around the world that women are the most underutilized resource in the world, how do I use this resource more effectively? What questions do I ask? What tools do I give? I, I want to open it up for discussion, but I have to push back slightly in that as you yourself articulated, and I think all three of you have put forward very clearly, the issue isn't the data. No. The issue isn't telling people of good faith and other governments, this is, this is money to be had for your budget. There are other issues, as you mentioned, power and tradition and, and the missing political representation that Manoush spoke about. So, so that's why I was trying to push you three on the issue oh. of traction. Absolutely. And by the way, when we, for example, we took a big step forward, I believe, in economic development when we linked development dollars to metrics around government corruption. Right. Well, let's take it a step further. What if we link development dollars to metrics around women's participation in agriculture and a whole set of economies? I mean, um, yes, it's very difficult and there are issues of power. My only point is, and I think Heidi and Minusha's point is, this actually isn't rocket science. No, no. It's, it's pretty actually straightforward. It is delicate, divisive, and hard to talk about. <laughs> well, we're trying. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience who want to raise questions to any of our speakers. There's a roving mic up front. If you're near the back, head to the standing mic. All we ask is that you identify yourself when you raise your hand and give a question. Anybody out there? Otherwise, I will force things. Carolyn, please. Um. Carolyn Freund, the Peterson Institute, and I'm also the former chief economist of the Middle East and North Africa at the World Bank. And um, we recently, so I'm going to talk uh, with respect to that region because we recently put out after a lot of work a report on gender. That was one of the last uh, flagship reports I, I put out in that position. And one thing it showed with which uh, Manoush talked about was this huge gain in education and other human development indicators, but the low labor, labor force participation under 30%. And on top of that, you actually have the highest unemployment rate of women versus men. So even though there's so few of them out there, they're not getting employed. And so this is where I want to push Manoush a bit on that it's mostly fiscal. Because what, what, what our report, I think, showed uh, pretty, pretty robustly was that it's actually social norms. And this also links to the point of outrage, that there's not enough outrage. Because how do you tackle social norms? And, and I find the word mainstream versus outrage, which have come up here, in some sense, to be kind of opposites that one way you can take outrage, and I had the same thought as, as Adam, that should be sanctions. That should mean we sanction, just like we did uh, South Africa, countries that really mistreat women. On the other hand, there's mainstreaming, where we try to work within the system. And clearly, the mainstreaming has been the way that institutions have been working. So I just want, want to push a bit on how do we tackle this issue of, of social norms and again raise this issue of sanctions because I don't think anyone really uh, addressed it directly and I know it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you. It was an excellent session. I very much enjoyed it. I should have said that at the beginning. And, and I should just say we're, we're very delighted. Carolyn Freund joined the Institute as a senior fellow in early May and she could just as easily have been up here for this session but we decided to not overwhelm you with speakers. Um, so please, Manoush and others, if you want to respond. Yeah, I mean, I think on the, um, on the Middle East, I mean, I did acknowledge we think it's mostly fiscal, but there is this culture piece which we're not experts on, so I'm deferring to others on that. And there clearly is a, a, you know, a social element to this. And that's why many countries deviate from the pattern we observe, which is as you get richer, more women enter the workforce. Um, I guess what I'd say is, though, that social norms change. Um, and you know, if you look at if you look at labor force participation for women in the Middle East, it is it is 
I think the real worry there, what, what the argument you often hear in the Middle East is, we have such high unemployment rates. The men can't get jobs. Why should we give the women jobs? We should be focusing on employing all these young, unemployed, testosterone-filled men who might cause a revolution if we don't employ them. So let's give the women, uh, let's, let's leave the women at home. I think that reflects a completely uh, kind of old-fashioned, zero-sum game view of how economies work. Um, the problem in the Middle East is that nobody gets jobs, be it men or women, and that these economies are failing to create jobs because, as you well know, the business environment, the way um, the way the public sector works, the way the public sector has, distor has distorted the, the labor markets and so on. So I guess for the Middle East, I would, I think you can actually get quite far simply by pushing the reform for jobs agenda. Um, and then beyond that, I think you do have to get into the realm of culture, and I suspect someone other than the IMF should speak to that, to that issue. And then just, I wouldn't mind just commenting on your point about mainstreaming versus outrage, because I think it's kind of, you're right, it's a, you know, going back to college in the 80s, you know, if you remember the co debates in college, do you change the world in the system or from outside the system? Do you protest or do you, right? right? And in some sense, mainstreaming is the inside the system approach, and your outrage is the, and, and what was the lesson we learned from South Africa? You needed a bit of both. Um, and I suspect for, for women and women's economic roles, we need a bit of both, some outrage and some mainstreaming. Very well said. Heidi, did you want to? Um, just a, a couple of points. The, the first is that um, it's, it's very clear when we have introduced metrics um, into our development policy that are gender related that you do see, you do, you see responsiveness to it because usually they have to do with, with receiving some kind of, of funding or, um, or support on the other side. The second is for some, for some countries in the, the Middle East, um, you do have a, an increasingly highly educated female population. I just was in the Middle East a couple of weeks ago and heard from a senior official in UAE that they're benefiting right now from a huge influx of Saudi highly educated women that are all getting driver's licenses and trying to start businesses there. And that's great, and that's very good. Not great for Saudi, but great for UAE. And they were pleased with that. Um, the question in the way that the U.S. government, both through the State Department and USAID, have, um, have tried to tackle this, um, this, this very you know, sensitive issue around, around culture um, is really drive, drive home um, back towards you know, the, the good work that you do at, at the, or did at the World Bank, which is look at what are the institutions. Um, inheritance policies. What are what are some of the things that result in policy that can actually that that more deeply ingrain some of those of those um, cultural and social issues, and also hitting at um, entrepreneurship and private sector um, empowerment through credit and mentoring and all sorts of programs that can get women access to the types of things that they will they will be able to use to empower themselves in that kind of an environment. Great. But may, I, may I just add one thing? First of all, I think we have far more tools in our toolkit than sanctions. So I wasn't even proposing sanctions. Um, I think there are many issues around which we apply in a very sensible mainstream way the levers of metrics and policy. Climate change would be an example where there's actually a great deal of outrage and people, whatever you think of that issue, and people are using the tools of policy and persuasion and influence and metrics to try and make a difference. My point, however, is that frequently action and innovative thinking and policies and metrics come from a sustained sense that something is truly amiss and that it has to be fixed to move forward. Great. I'm very conscious of the time. We usually cut off at 2. I'm willing to go a little over, but I want to get in some more of the audience comments, please, at the back mic. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Stella Dawson from the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and may I congratulate you on the discussion, and particularly Kali Fiorani. I thought your comments about the lack of outrage are extremely interesting. As a woman who grew up in the 1970s British feminism, I think the outrage there was absolutely critical, the changes we made. But I had to leave Britain in order to have a successful career. There were no opportunities for me. Anyway, to my question, I'd be very interested to know what your views are 
uh, on having specific quotas for women for political positions. It's a strategy that's being used in a number of countries around the world. And academic research has indicated that uh, you need something over 30% uh, number of women in key positions before you have uh, much change in policy making. Thank you. Uh, I was addressed to Carly first, I guess, and then if one of the other ones wants to come in. So I think there, there are many points of view about quotas. Um, in my business experience, I will say I have not found quotas per se to be that effective. However, what I have found to be extremely effective is to um, constrain people's choices. So what do I mean by that? Let me just give you a very brief example. When I came to HP, a company that prided itself on diversity, I found that the senior team was incredibly homogeneous and had been for decades. So I had two choices, establish quotas, which by the way existed at lower levels in the organization, or say to people, for each and every senior position, you must interview a diverse set of qualified candidates, which will include women and people of color. For every position, you must interview diverse and qualified candidates. And frequently what would happen is people would come to me and say, oh, I can't find any qualified women. And I would say, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You haven't looked. Go back and look again. In other words, the constraint I put on the problem was you must have a full slate, diverse candidates before you get to fill the position. And what happened over time? What happened over time is people picked the most qualified candidate. And within several years, our senior team, that is people who reported directly to me, were half women. Now the gains are also fragile. 80% of our senior women had left HP within nine months of my departure. This, it, it's a very fragile environment that gets created. But I guess what I would say from my own experience is, if you put quotas on things, sometimes what people will do is grab the first one they can find, check a box, and then say to people, I had to do it because I have a quota. As opposed to asking them to step up a little higher, find qualified people, and then make a choice and own the choice. I'm not sure how well that translates to an electorate, but it's a very good perspective to have. Uh, at, the back, at the back mic, and then there's someone else who I'll ask to go to the back mic after them. So if you could. Hi, I'm Judith Williams. I'm with the Government Accountability Office in our International Affairs and Trade Team. I've been trying to get uh, The Hill interested in us doing a review on U.S. policy regarding women in general for years. I've kind of taken it from a development perspective, perhaps I should go more toward a trade perspective. But I'd be interested in hearing from e any of you um, if there's anyone on the Hill that you know of who has been a champion for these issues, who might be interested in these issues, or has it been crickets for you all as well? <laughs> well, he Heidi comes directly from the Hill to her current job, so maybe we can start there. Uh well, I, I worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and one of the things that then Senator Kerry did, one of the first things he did was create this, the first subcommittee on um, global women's issues. So that, that's one place that I would, I would look to, and that was um, a, a committee that, that Senator Barbara Boxer chaired and, and felt quite passionately about. So I don't think there's, a, there's an absence of, of desire to engage on these issues on the Hill. But I think, again, there's always there's a need to kind of get, if you want to mainstream and, and tackle something, then you have to find um, leadership at the top that's going to, that's going to help propel that through the institution. Okay. Uh, the gentleman at the back, if you could move to the microphone. Yeah, that's you. I'm uh, Glenn Fukushima with the Center for American Progress. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about Japan, so I wanted to make two points about Japan. Uh, I speak from the perspective of someone who worked in Japan for 20 years, just returned to the United States last year. And my wife, who is Japanese, uh, has been on the board of about, I think, 13 or so uh, Japanese companies, major Japanese companies, usually the first and only woman to join the board of Sony, uh, Bridgestone, Mitsubishi, and other companies. Um, and I worked with Carly actually about 20 years ago. You probably don't remember it. Oh, with, yes, uh, I Bill do. Bill Marks and Network <laughs> Systems trying to yes, sell 5 switches in Japan, NTT. 
the two points I want to make. Number one is that I think the problems in Japan about women uh, uh, having the ability to participate fully in the workforce is a very, very deeply rooted issue that's not only fiscal and, and, and cultural, but institutional. I'll give you one example. Uh, Ms. Iwa, Mrs. Iwata, who, uh, the wife of the former uh, governor, uh, governor of the Bank of Japan, who was for many years a senior uh, executive at Shiseido, the cosmetics company, said that the whole way of working in Japanese companies has to change in order for women to be able to participate in the sense that the men are required to spend so many hours in the office, so many hours playing golf on the weekends. It is so <laughs> onerous for the men that and their performance evaluation is done not only on, on the results, but on the amount of time one spends. So <laughs> in Shiseido, one of the ways to get women to be able to pursue more fully was to change the way that people work so they could be more efficient. But that's a huge undertaking. And with the CEO who was very committed, they finally were able to get about 18% of the managers to be women. But so it's a very, uh, it, it is a very deeply rooted uh, institutional structure in Japan that makes it difficult, and the cultural issue of men not wanting to spend time raising kids and so forth. Glenn, so do you have a question point, for our panel? <laughs> do second, you have a question yes. for our panel? So uh, my question is, uh, how, given that, how does one effectively change that? And I think that to borrow from the trade negotiations of many years ago, the attention from the outside world is very important and focusing on that, whether it's the IMF, the State Department, or uh, Peterson, or whatever, it's very, very important. But if it is done in the wrong way, it can be very counterproductive and be considered to be very ethnocentric and very US-centered. So how does one change a very, very deeply rooted institutional cultural uh, system without engaging that kind of uh, counter, uh, uh, the, the negative effects? That, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so how does one go about telling other governments and societies it's really in your interest and even though it seems like we're attacking your culture, tough luck, change anyway. Um, <laughs> is there a good way to do that? Well, I, I was hoping in the way that I characterized it as being incredibly supportive. Um, I, think, I think this is a, this is a huge show of leadership from from the Prime Minister, and to the extent that, that this can actually move the needle, it'll be a huge testament to, to the leadership of the Japanese government. So right. I think to the extent that, that, you know, that outside you know, friendly governments can provide the kind of, of moral support in what is you know, inevitably going to be a, a, a significant endeavor. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, an appropriate role. But let's, let's take this just for one second beyond Japan, even though I love mm. doing that. Um, Manoush, I mean, you, you spoke about this becoming a real issue in Article 4s, mm. the, the annual consultations the IMF does with member countries. I mean, how do, how do you take Glenn's concern in that, into account in that way? Mm. You know, I think in a lot of these countries, it's a question of national survival. You know, if you look at Japan or Italy, it's the same story. You you have very low female labor, f female labor force participation, but also terrible demographics. Um, so the women, what, what clearly happens is women go into the workforce, so they play by these job rules for a while, but then as soon as they have a child, they withdraw from the labor market. That's the clear pattern in Japan, also similar in Italy. Um, but the, uh, the conditions under which they can have a child and the lack of support they have, the lack of high quality childcare, the lack of adequate maternity leave and so on, mean that they have no option to withdraw from the labor force. But if you look at the choices they make, they'll have one child and you start the horrible cycle of demographic decline, which you see in both Japan and Italy. So you know, just from a question of national survival, you know, your country will die out if you don't solve this problem. Um, so, you know, I think it's not, you know, we, as I said, we don't do culture at the IMF. We don't advise on culture. That's not our business. But from an economic point of view, it is a question of survival. Um, now, countries can develop all sorts of, you know, they have to define their own culturally appropriate solutions. But, but I think when faced with a choice that, that is that stark, uh, I think, um, I think change is inevitable. Carly, do you want to add anything on this? 
Well, I would certainly agree that with Heidi that when you see examples of leadership that is changing the order of things in a positive way, that leadership needs to be supported tremendously. And the Prime Minister will be criticized for this, and so all of the support that we can give Abe for taking these steps and making this a part of his policy, <coughs> I think, is hugely helpful. Um, I, I certainly agree as well that the most compelling argument that one can make to someone is self-interest. Do this not because you're pleasing someone else, but for your own self-interest. However, we know that it is in our nature as human beings to be self-destructive sometimes. <laughs> we know that people are capable of hanging on to habits or traditions that are actually not productive for them. So the question, I think, is how, having made the cogent, rational case based on self-interest for higher and better inclusion of women, having celebrated and lifted up examples of leadership that are making a positive difference, having incorporated in all of our policies the levers, the tools of metrics, and all of the mainstreaming techniques that we can come up with to help encourage this. How, when all of that is done, is there an opportunity to engage with people on what is, for, in some cases, the heart of the matter? I'm afraid to change. I'm threatened by change. Uh, these are my cultural traditions. It's just too scary to contemplate. How, how does one engage in that conversation? And that's where I think, honestly, the, there needs to be an equally powerful, profound sentiment against that fear of change, which is why I happen to use the word outrage. We have to have something profound to go at that. Very nice. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to cut off questions there. We're already over our time. I would like to let Heidi, who started us off down this very substantive and important path, to have the last word. Is there anything particular coming out of Carly and Minutia's vociferous agreement with your remarks that you would like to pick up on in closing? Well, first I'd like to thank them for, for being such fantastic discussants and um, for agreeing and, and forwarding the, the case. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Adam, for, um, for really taking the lead and, and hosting this at Peterson. I think that in and of itself is an enormous statement. Um, and I give you a huge amount of credit for that, so thank you. No, thanks to you. And thanks to all of you. As I said, for those of you here the first time, not every issue is going to be this issue. Not every speaker will be as brilliant as these speakers, but we hope this is not the last time you're with us and that we'll continue to contribute with people like this and our team. Thank you very much.